You all know I love bad movies. In fact, one of my favorite movies ever made is Moonfall. I can't stop preaching the gospel of how incredibly awful that movie is in all of the best ways, making it one of the most entertaining films ever created. I just really love bad films, but of course there is a line. There's boring bad, where there's nothing redeemable about it, it's just a slog to get through and it's just not fun. And then there's fun bad, where a movie is so bad that it becomes extremely enjoyable, especially when watching with friends. And I always that the Twilight movies were in the first camp. Boring bad. I thought it was just going to be throwaway, silly, schlocky romance for teens. But what I'd never realized until chat enlightened me, opened my third eye to the truth, is that it's actually fun bad. So I took them at their word. And I gathered the gang. So Aaron, Meadow, Tiana, and I started watching Twilight yesterday. And I've got to tell you, what an incredibly awful, fun film. It's just such a joyful experience. The movie is so special in that it does nothing well. Not a single thing. There is nothing in Twilight that is even remotely competent. And that makes it amazing. And it also moves at a million miles an hour. The film was two hours long and I actually felt like I had just ventured through by the end of it because I thought it had only been like five. Time moves so much quicker when watching it. It's so impressive in how shittily unashamed it is uh, with, with its production here. So I was ranting and raving about it on stream for like 30 so I'm just going to play the clips of that where I was debriefing about the film. What I do want to talk about is what I did today with Aaron, Tiana, and Meadow. And it's what I said I'd do on stream a couple weeks ago. We're doing a Twilight Marathon. I've never seen those movies and I always thought they'd be boring. But after chat convinced me that there were some outrageously stupid scenes that make it fun bad, we decided to take the plunge. We only watched one of them today. Holy f I cannot believe those movies were as popular as they were. It is mind-bogglingly awful. All of the romance actually feels like AI generated. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, honestly. There's so much. The movie moves at a breakneck pace. It's like two hours long, but by the end of it, I actually thought we'd only sat down for 10 minutes. It was crazy. So, it's like, he's like an animatronic. But he only has two settings, which is <laughs> hateful and stoic and nothing else. Like, like frozen solid and angry. So like he'll come up to Bella and he'll be like, love you. And then he'll like kind of push her and she falls and he'd grab her and be like, watch where you're going. Like, it's so weird. Like he literally keeps coming out of nowhere just to like say almost romantic and romantic I'm using super loosely like the romantic extent of his talk is you smell good I like your smell and I can't read your mind but then immediately after saying that he'd give her like the most foul look ever and run away after saying get the away from me get away from me you're not good for me get away I shouldn't even be here get away from me or like he walked up to her as she was trying to get back on the bus after like a field trip to I don't know <laughs> cannabis farm I don't even remember where they went but they're like composting with the and goes up to her after it and like starts small talk kind of and this is after he like pushed her down and then grabbed her and said watch where you're going he then comes up to her and he's like yeah you're just not good for me and then they have like a small talk and she's like well why did you even save me then and he's like Ugh. and then his sister and brother come up and he's and they ask if she's getting on the bus and he goes no this bus is full as he looks at her and, like, shoos her away. That's, like, half the movie. Like, at no point, at any level of that film, is there any, like, romantic tension between them. It's so weird. It's so disconcerting. Like, it just feels uncomfortable every step of the way. It's, like, pure disdain for one another. And, like, the... A I understand everyone critiqued the acting, but it is so true how awful the acting is across the board i want to pull up a scene and it's one that i watched on stream which is what sold me on it it's the baseball scene this is in the first movie and i didn't know that so he takes her to baseball pretty quickly after what i just told you with the bus thing where he's like this bus is full 
And you know, shoo, 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 shoo. Get the out of here. Poor harpy, run. Get away from me. And then he like ends up inviting her to a baseball game with his family of vampires. And this shit is so stupid. And the movie is so ugly because they have this awful like blue filter on everything. So then they're out here playing baseball. It, it's it's so uncomfortable. It's so weird. And we watched the extended director's cut, which was only like an additional six of staring at each other. So when these people come up, the only time we've seen them is they some guy on a boat implied. And then he makes out with her and this guy smiles and watches for like 15 seconds. I you not. That was one of the extended director's cut scenes that they threw in there. Him watching these two make out. And it goes on for an uncomfortable duration. So he's apparently chief cuck of this vampire team. And then they come out here to play baseball, but then everything goes awry because he smells Bella, and he likes her smell. So now he's hunting Bella, and that's the enemy. It's so unbelievably dumb. Like, I couldn't believe what I was watching. I couldn't believe it. These movies were wildly popular. And yet, it is terrible. It's not good as romance, it's not good as anything. Nothing works. In all the right ways. It was fun bad. It was actually fun bad. Are you team or team Jacob? So we only started uh, the second Twilight, New Moon. We're 40 in, but Aaron fell asleep after 20 minutes. So we decided we'll just postpone it till tomorrow and pick it up again. We'll have to rewind it to catch him up. But right now, Jacob is the only one that can actually even talk to Bella without just re like relentlessly insulting and belittling her. Every time he talks to her, it's just mainly insults and being weird and edgy. One of the things he says, I you not, while they're in and they're watching Romeo and Juliet, uh, he says, man, you know, I really envy them. And Bella goes, why, well, you know, Juliet's perfect and their love and all that. And he's like, no, because they can kill themselves. <laughs> no, I envy their suicide. It's so stupid. And that's like half of his lines. So yeah, uh, we finished the first one. The second one's already off to a crazy start. Uh, in the second one, the big conflict that happens right away is a scene that we also saw. Uh, it's the paper cut scene. So what happens here, it's like right off rip. He's taking Bella to, like, her, her birthday party with the vampires here. And she cuts her finger. And Jasper, this guy who's in a state of perpetual Vietnam flashbacks, sees the blood after she cuts herself on the, uh, the present. And this guy just has a breakdown. So he, like, charges her, then pushes Bella all the way against this, breaking all of this, shattering it all on her arm where she's bleeding even more. And then... He looks at her so disappointed. Like, you, how could you bleed in front of my family? Have you no shame? So then he breaks up with her because she bled. The logic being, I guess he wanted to protect her because she bleeds. <laughs> I am so drawn into the lunacy of this franchise. I had no idea it was like this. I thought it was a standard romance, like absolute garbage, throwaway schlock. It is so special in how unapologetically, nonsensically stupid it is. It doesn't even do the romance right. Or at all, for that matter. And there's five of these, too. There's five Twilight movies. Maybe that's the reason they're so popular? I don't know. I remember people, like, really losing their goddamn mind about how romantic it was. Like, Fifty Shades of Grey was Twilight fanfic. So people got really into this series. And I don't get how. Like, even the... I'll pull up another scene real quick. Even the introduction of... Is so uncomfortable and weird. Because it's all about she's stinky. Or, well, actually the opposite of stinky. Her aroma is intoxicating. So she walks into... And he, and look at... This... this it's, it's so shameless. Over here squirming and squealing because, because he can smell her. <laughs> it's so bad. And this, this doesn't go away. He is actually like this the entire movie, even when they're together. And it, it, again, half of the movie is them staring at each other uncomfortably. That is true. That, that cliche was 100% accurate. But man, I had no idea what we were in for. It is so good in all the worst ways. The third video's description... This is the part where it wants to bite Bella's face off and drink her blood in science. Hot. 
Like I said, we're only one movie deep. Aaron fell asleep mid-second movie, so we're going to have to pick it up tomorrow. I thought it was blasphemous that he fell asleep. I don't even know how he could because it was literally non-stop nonsense. It might have just overwhelmed his brain and shut it off. Because like I said, the second one actually starts with her bleeding and being super upset that she bleeds. So then he breaks up with her and they move. And then she sits inside for like five months sending emails to a disabled email. Until then she goes to Jacob's place to fix up a bike. <laughs> so dumb. Like, Bella has no reason to even like it. She immediately falls in love with him and becomes completely obsessed to the point where once they break up, she has mid- she has night every single night for five months. Because they're broken up. But there was nothing ever did that was anything resembling love. Oh, that's another thing! The sparkles. So... I had always heard the meme of like, sparkle, glitter vampires, twilight, garbage, not real vampires, not glitter vampires. I thought it was just an expression for them being like super silly and not intimidating, just really lame. They actually sparkle. There's a scene in this movie where he's like, you're gonna have to see what I look like in the sun. You're gonna, I want you to see the real me. And I expected him to go in the sun and melt and look like the goddamn thing from Total Recall that pops out of that dude's chest. Like, I thought he was going to be this repulsive ooze of a person. Like Deadpool without the suit on. He goes into the sun, he turns around, and he's the same goddamn guy, but he has sparkles on his chest. <laughs> I had no clue. It was a crazy plot twist. He's like, we can't go outside in the day or else people would see we're different. Because they're sparkling. So he's like, get on my back, and he gives her a turbo speed uh, piggyback ride, and he's like, it's time you see me for what I really am in the sunlight, and why we can't go in the sun. So he builds it up, he's standing there, I thought he was going to turn around and look completely disheveled and, like, terrible, and he's the same! <laughs> this is me. Like, there's no difference, like, I can't even see his face sparkling, it's not until it zooms in on his chest, and he has this glisten. Which at first I honestly thought he was just fuzzy. So I thought the thing was he had a bunch of peach fuzz and it was he couldn't grow real chest hair. But that's not it. He's sparkling. Did I teleport back to 20 2010 when Twilight was relevant? You actually have. You're right now in a time vortex. Because I'm watching this franchise for the first time and I'm blown away by how bad it is. It is shocking. I am, I am absolutely loving it. Is it Moonfall level though? It's not Moonfall level yet, but there is five of these, so it could get there. It really could. And it's off to a great start to getting there. Because again, it has so much runway with five of these things. What she says to her dad when she leaves is brutal. It was also a stupid plan. Yeah, at the end of the movie, like once that guy smells her and she's like, and he says like, damn, that's a good stink. Man, that odorous is really, you know, driving me wild. They immediately recognize that he's going to track her forever. So plan was uh, the the baseball guy. Uh, the, where is he? His name's like James. Or... Yeah, James. So this guy's sniffed her at the baseball game. And they're like, okay, he's going to track her forever now. He's, he's going to be obsessed. Which he was. So the plan was, in order to save her dad, told her that he needs to, or she needs to like break his heart and leave the state. So she just drops, like, the hardest, like, meanest to her dad who's done nothing wrong. He's just been, like, this real sad, lonely dad. And she breaks his heart. And Aaron made a good point. She could have just told him he was she was going on a field trip. <laughs> like, she didn't need to go that hard. She could have literally just said that she was going on a field trip. <laughs> it was entirely unnecessary. I don't make love, I f hard. That, I still think, is one of the... I made a whole video dedicated to that line. I still think that's one of the best lines in cinema history. That's from Fifty Shades of Grey... Fifty Shades 3, I don't remember what it's called. Fifty Shades Super Grey, the third one. Or, no, or the first one. It's the first one. Yeah, it is the first one, not the third one. He actually says that. Yeah, he makes her sign a contract... And then she says, are you going to make love to me now? So he, he leans down and he says, I don't make love. I f hard. <laughs> Epic. Goosebumps. Every time. Also, it was super cute because Aaron and Meadow had um, 
Twilight shirts on today, so we were really in the in, in the zone. Aaron was rocking Team Jacob. <laughs> Meadow had Team. It was not Rari. I, I I really don't remember what it was. Moist Meter Twilight Saga. No, but I'll probably do these debriefings after each movie. On stream. I mean, I've already been ranting about it for like 15 now. I I have so many thoughts on it. If I was to plug it into the Moist Meter, I'd be giving it all the way up to like an 85. This is a very fun, bad movie. But like realistically, like objectively as a movie, it'd be like a 20 at most. But I always heavily weigh the fun of a film. That's what I expected, but it's not. Like, even their action scenes are full of entertaining cringe, like the baseball thing, or, um... When he saved Bella from that ragtag group of dudes who were, like, uh, hustling her on it. Audio? Uh, I, I don't want it to get, like, DMCA'd, because I don't know how that's gonna work with Twilight, to be honest with you. But you don't need the audio. That's the beauty of their acting. Their actions speak louder than words. Distract me so I don't turn around. Oh yeah, they're driving away and he's like hyperventilating. And he's like mad at her. The entire ride, like, home. He's like mad at her for it. He's like, distract me! So I don't turn around and rip their heads off. And then he just gets like real aggressive with her. And then they eventually both like touch the... The air conditioning. And their hands touch. And then he gives her like the nastiest look of all time. He's like, oh my god, there you... <laughs> you... He's 109 years old. He's not 2,000. And also, his backstory is really silly. So, the story is the Cullen family comes from one guy, Dr. Cullen. I forgot his name. It's like Car Carlisle, Carlio, like that. And he's a doctor. His whole thing is he wants to help people. But if he can't save them, he turns them into a vampire to save them. And it was the first one back in 1918. But if that's really the case, and he's been a doctor for this many years, hundred uh, over 100 years now... He would have definitely had more than like six vampires that he'd turn. If his whole thing is, I'm saving everyone I can. He would have absolutely like turned a thousand, ten thousand people by this point as a doctor. He's not gonna be able to save all of them. So who is he picking and choosing? Did you mention the scene where he asks her about Jacksonville? Then she trips and he calls her an idiot for tripping. That's what I was talking about. That's at the, uh, like the, the, I don't, the hemp farm or wherever they went. I don't know. The, where they were composting. That's what I was talking about. Like... I forgot the conversation was about Jacksonville, but he was like, he overheard her mention Jacksonville. And he's like, well, what's in Jacksonville? And then he like kind of, I thought he, he, I thought he nudged her, but maybe she just tripped. So she like loses her balance and like trips and he grabs her and he's like, oh my God, look, can you, can you look where you're going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, was, I mentioned that. I'm a human being with a lot of emotions, but the main one you're going to see me exhibit today is anger. I got into a bit of a debate with a friend of mine today about what show has the worst ending and just remembering some of these endings just got my blood boiling. You know, I couldn't help but just grit my teeth. Get, like, real upset about it as I talked about how some of these endings ruined amazing shows. Now, obviously, I think the right answer for the worst ending of all time goes to Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones was one of TV's most popular productions. Even just mentioning Game of Thrones and their ending is immediately causing a monsoon, so... You can see even the, the Thunder Gods are upset about how that wrapped up. Of course, there are other shows with noteworthy, horrible conclusions, but Game of Thrones is the obvious, festering, oozing zit that we just need to pop right away. It is, I think, objectively the worst conclusion ever to anything. It the entire franchise and its relevancy forever. Think of other equally popular shows like Breaking Bad, which ended far before Game of Thrones, but it had an amazing ending and Breaking Bad is still talked about constantly today. Whereas Game of Thrones, no one brings it up. Except for Game of Thrones House of Dragon, and that's because it's brand new. But no one brings up anything about Game of Thrones anymore that isn't related to House of the Dragon. Like, it just doesn't happen because Season 8 was so horrible that everyone collectively wanted to forget it. We all came together as a society and tried to, like, hypnotize ourselves into believing that it wasn't real. Like a Men in Black neuralizer trying to erase it from our memory. Even though Season 7 wasn't great either, Season 7 was when it really started to go downhill, but everyone huffed a lot of copium praying that Season 8 would redeem it. But instead, it just publicly executed the franchise and Gangnam-style Fortnite danced on top of its corpse. It was disturbing how awful it was. Rest in peace, Game of Thrones. What's really interesting about it is there's an actual reason for why it's in the last two seasons and had a terrible finale. Like, you can actually pinpoint exactly the cause, the catalyst, for this eruption of... 
And it's because the showrunners, D&D, D.B. Weiss, and David Binioff, had just landed a Star Wars deal where once they finished Game of Thrones, they'd be working on Star Wars. And they were so excited, like kids on Christmas morning, they got Star Wars, that they decided to, you know, throw away Game of Thrones. You know, they were done playing with that toy, put it back in the toy chest so they could move on to cooler, like Star Wars. So HBO offered them more seasons to wrap up the series, but D&D decided they didn't want that. They, they decided to speed run it. And that's exactly what we got. A rushed, putrid pile of puke. They just vomited a bunch of nonsense and haphazardly threw it all together. It was like me back in high school trying to finish a writing project I hadn't started and get it all done the night before it was due. It was terrible. So bad, in fact, that even the actors were laughing about it before it aired, sarcastically calling it the best season ever or just laughing about, you know, it being disappointing. The, the actors also were pretty well that this was unsatisfactory and most people were going to be let down. And they were right. It was trash. It was truly terrible. And of course, a lot of people fell back onto the excuse of, it's not D&D's fault. This is what George R.R. Martin wrote. He gave them notes on where he wanted the series to finish, and they were just following his instructions. But you're wrong, you brain-dead Twitter zombie. That's not exactly the case, because if you'd use even the simplest amount of reasoning, you would realize that even if those plot points are exactly what George R.R. Martin wanted, I don't think he wanted them done in the span of a single episode. I mean, he'd want them built up. Because what happened in Season 8 is all of these plot points, all these like big plot events, all happened within one or two episodes, whereas before it'd be one or two seasons. Think about how long it took them to get from point A to point B back in like Season 5. They spent all season marching. Whereas in Season 7, they went from one side of the continent to the other in one episode. Like they sent a message and I guess all of a sudden they had walkie-talkies or cell phones because they were able to communicate back and forth instantaneously and travel that fast too. They completely changed how things moved in the show by making it instantaneous transportation as well as information traveling instantly. And not only that, those plot points that happened in Season 8, they happen out of nowhere because they had no opportunity nor any effort to make them make sense. Like, I don't even think it's the actual things that happen that people take issue with. It's the fact that they happen out of nowhere because they just took all of these big things and threw them into a cauldron and brewed up this disgusting witch's potion of filth. It just didn't work because they tried to rush everything into a single season. It was dumb. It was stupid. And then they tried to fall back on this, well, we subverted your expectations, didn't we? And in their defense, they're right. They did subvert all of our expectations by surprising us with how horrible it was. And they even subverted their own expectations because this was so poorly received and the franchise in such a colossal way that D&D lost their Star Wars deal. And to this day, three and a half years later, they still have not had a big project that they have worked on. Neither one of them. This was so awful that it has effectively stunted their career for the last three years. It, maybe it's ruined it forever. Their reputation certainly is in the... I don't know how you come back from this because of how they handled Season 8 in particular, but Season 7 was also bad. So, you know, it, it's poetic, really. I got a little lost in the sauce here, ranting about this show once again, but it is, I think, the absolute worst ending to anything that's ever been created. Now, I'd like to give a couple honorable mentions here. The first one going to The Promised Neverland. Promised Neverland is a manga and anime series with the first season of the anime being hailed as a masterpiece. It was widely praised by pretty much everyone that watched it, and season two completely ruined it uh, in a way I've never seen done before. I think it's the worst ending to any anime as well as anything animated ever. It is super. Unlike Game of Thrones, it's not even just the writing being bad and everything going wrong. This show stopped being animated. Season 2, the ending... Let me explain. So Season 2 follows the characters right after Season 1 where it leaves off. There's no, like, jumps or gaps or anything. But what ends up happening is by Episode 3, they decided we gotta finish it quick. And it was so bad that the people that worked on it, the higher-ups that worked on Promise Neverland Season 2, had their names scrubbed from the project. You can't actually find some of the credits here because the people didn't want their name with it because they knew it was terrible. This was while it was airing they took their names off because they knew how bad it was. It's beyond, it's shocking how awful it was. So, aside from things happening where they'll just pull in characters to be like... It's hard to explain without spoilers and I guess it's no reason not to. But a character you thought was dead in season one comes back and he's like, actually, I'm not dead, and I actually found a way to every demon here. 
I came up with this nuclear potion here that'll every demon that's ever existed and solve all of our problems. He doesn't explain how. He just has it. And he's like, I'm gonna kill all the demons. So then he goes and uses it on a village, and then's like, oh, maybe this isn't good. Maybe I don't want to kill the demons. I'm like, good. I'm glad you didn't want to do that anymore. So then they go to, like, the main demon headquarters. They have a big victory there. But the manga continues for, like, ten more chapters, or but they didn't want to for the anime. So what they did then, after their victory, they then did a five, I think it was five or six slideshow of, like, art where after we won here, we encountered hardship here with the demons. But then we won there, he, won there, and then we won here, and then we made this portal to go between human and demon world, and we used it. And then we did that, and now we're in the human world and we're happy. And it's all explained in a post-narration and slideshow, like individual pieces of art that show it not animated. It's so laughably bad. It is regarded as the most disrespectful season of any anime ever because they completely gave up. They just threw in the towel and didn't actually give it any kind of care whatsoever. It's the end of season two, and it showed. So yeah, definitely a very special catastrophe there. I don't even understand how it happened because The Promised Neverland was an absolutely success, so I don't know why they wiped their ass with it in season two and fumbled it, but it is what it is. Now, one of the other... Th endings that my friends pointed out like i don't even know why i was being vague about it this this was on the podcast i talked about it with andrew jackson and kaya though it was mainly just andrew and i that were talking about endings because jackson and kaya also agreed with game of thrones but andrew brought up one that i didn't know and it's how i met your mother so i looked into it a bit and i completely agree this sounds like i only watched a few episodes of how i met your mother but andrew enlightened me on why the ending was so unbelievably horrible Basically what happens is you spend the entire show wondering like, oh, who, who's the mom of all these people here? You know, it could be anyone, it could be Robin, you, it could be this and that, and you just have this guessing game. And then the show ends with it being like a completely different woman who's already dead, and then the guy goes to Robin anyway. So it's just like this totally worthless like, haha, surprise, it wasn't who you thought it was going to be, but it, it, it still kind of is, as I understand it. Again, I didn't watch a lot of How I Met Your Mother, so I can't opine too heavily on it, but just the idea of that as like a gotcha thing, like, haha, you couldn't have expected it to be this this woman who's already dead, did you? It just kind of makes me laugh. That does sound like... And looking into it, it seems like most people hated the ending, but still liked the show. And a show like How I Met Your Mother can get away with a bad ending because it's not so much about where it ends, it's more about the journey. Like, it's it's a comedy. You're having fun, you're laughing... But when it's a show like Promise Neverland or Game of Thrones, the ending is extremely important because the journey and the destination really matter. Like, yeah, you've had a lot of fun along the way, but you need to see how it all wraps up. Whereas here, you know, the main point is being comedic. So as long as you were laughing, it accomplished its goal. We also briefly mentioned the ending to Lost as well as the ending to Scrubs, both of which are very subpar and not appreciated by huge fans of the series. Again, in both of those shows, I only know a little bit about them. I only watch them on and off, so I don't have a strong feeling on either one. But we did all recognize that they have terrible conclusions and fans don't like them. But the only other show that I can strongly give my perspective on for a terrible ending is yet another anime, which I know, kind of weeby. I've listed two anime, but, you know, anime is notorious for having terrible endings. Like, I don't know what it is, but so many anime just have absolute garbage finales. And that's the case with this show, Platinum End. But the difference is the show is bad. Platinum End is just not a good show at all, but the ending is special in how horrible it is. I, this I'm just going to fully spoil. So Platinum End is about choosing the next god. God's dying, need a new god. So some of the angels go out there, choose people, they compete to be the next god, and eventually they do come to a conclusion on who it's going to be. And it's a child who throughout the entire show has said numerous times that all he wants to do is... Like, that's the main thing. He wants people to be able to be on their own terms, and for him to die as well. And that's who they choose to be god. And what happens when he becomes god? Almost immediately into the job, like almost right after becoming God, he says, hmm, looks like these people don't need me. So he's himself. And when he takes his own life, all of humanity ceases to exist. They all poof out of existence. Roll credits. It's, it's baffling how stupid it is, but that's the ending. It's so bad. It's so dumb. But the show's terrible, so it's not like it ruined a good show or anything. The whole thing was horrible, and it just had an even worse ending. So, 
Yeah, just wanted to mention these things. I, I just got to talking about, like, bad endings to shows, so I, I just wanted to kind of rant about it. That's really about it. See ya. I love making fun of bad media. Puts a big smile on my face, grinning from ear to ear. But very rarely will you catch me double dipping into the communal salsa bowl and insulting the same thing in multiple videos. Usually if I'm making fun of a horrible movie or show or video game, I'll make one video on the topic making jokes about why it's such an odorous pile of dog and then move on from it. It's like a one night stand. We share a night of fiery and then we fist bump each other, I tip my fedora, say thanks for the good madam and we both go our separate ways and that's the end of that. That, that, that concludes the evening. But in very rare, I'll make multiple videos just ranting about how trash a piece of media is. And that is reserved for the most exquisite of stinkers this world has to offer. And brace for impact, because here comes the cold water, Star Wars fans. Unfortunately, I'm putting my hand back in the cookie jar here. We're double fisting on this topic because the Acolyte has absolutely shocked me with just how bad it continues to be. It was only five days ago I conducted my investigation to find out whether or not the Acolyte is the worst Star Wars show that's ever been made, like a lot of people were claiming it is. And my findings as of five days ago are obsolete now. The data is archaic. It's antiquated. Because episode 4 just dropped, and at the time, episode 3 was the newest. And while I agreed the Acolyte was bad, I still didn't think it was worse than Book of Boba Fett, which is perhaps one of the most boring things ever produced in the history of our species. It'd be more stimulating to just listen to your English professor farting into a walkie-talkie for a two-hour Zoom meeting. It's so boring. And it has one of the worst scenes in television history with the Vespa chase scene that I reference all the time. That scene is so bad it should almost be considered, like charges, should almost be considered for whoever pitched that idea and then actually executed on it. It's a terrible show. I'd rather watch a 45 argument between my parents debating whether or not they should get a divorce. That'd be a lot less painful than sitting through a single episode of Book of Boba Fett. Point is, I still thought that show was worse. But, now that episode 4 The Acolyte dropped, I now see this has the potential to definitely sit in being the worst Star Wars thing ever made. It's shocking that they keep finding new ways of not only boring me, but also making me feel insulted for how stupid they must think the is that's watching it. And by the way, I wasn't even planning on watching this. I was more than content just dropping it after episode 3 and not really going back to it. But then I saw a headline saying that Kathleen Kennedy was saying that the low Rotten Tomatoes score of The Acolyte isn't normal, and then apparently went on to imply that it's because the majority of Star Wars fans are males, and since The Acolyte has a female lead, they weren't receptive to it, and then just not liking it because of that. Which I always think is a very interesting strategy to immediately blame the other one is failing. Now, of course it is true that there are certain weirdos out there that are going to hate because a woman is in it in a prominent role. That does exist. But I would argue that's not the majority of consumers of a product, because if that was the case, the Fallout series would have flopped. But the Fallout series is beloved. That is the most recent example I can think of. It was literally like two months ago. Everyone, including myself, was raving about how good the Fallout Prime series is. It's a great show, and it is a female lead there. And boy, howdy, let me tell you, hooey! If you thought the Star fandom was male-dominated, your eyes would pop out of your skull at the sausage fest that is the Fallout fandom. You haven't smelt what The Rock was cooking if you think Star is a male-dominated fandom. Fallout is very, very heavily skewed for a male, and yet the Fallout series, which has a female lead, did extraordinarily well and reviewed very, very well. Now again, like I mentioned, there were absolutely some glue-eating, diapers-crack-smoking weirdos that really did take a very serious issue with it being a female lead in their Fallout show. But it clearly wasn't the majority. It was a very small, smelly pocket of goobers. And the show did very well. So I don't think you can just point the finger at that for the Acolyte flopping. I really don't. But anyway, I plop my cheeks down back on my throne of swamp to watch episode 4 because they seem to really believe in it. So I thought, okay, is it about to start popping off? When does it get good? Are we about to enter into like the golden age here of the Acolyte? So, turning on episode 4 was a big mistake. It's the most boring episode so far, and also the one where I really feel like somebody else came in and wrote this without ever having watched the previous three episodes. And what's crazy is this had the easiest layup of all time to just be like a good episode. This has a Wookiee Jedi in it. Kal Naka. That, 
Everything Wookiees have ever done on screen in any Star Wars medium has been hype. And a, a, a Wookiee Jedi in Star Wars, like, is there an easy recipe for success? And do you know what they do with Kalnaka here? Do you, do you know what his role in this is? To be a Halloween decoration, basically. He, he's actually just a corpse. So Kalnaka, he was shown at the end of Episode 3, like, they've shown him a little bit uh, sporadically. And then Episode 4, it's all about May and Kimir. I already forgot his name. It's so hard to remember these characters' names because they're so forgettable, bland, generic, and just really poorly written. But May and her sidekick, who I think is going to have a big role to play, I'll get into that in a moment, are wandering through the forest and looking for the Wookiee Jedi Kalnaka because May still has that task from her Sith Lord, her, her master, to the the Jedi without using a weapon and she's going on about how difficult that is like how do you a Jedi without any type of weaponry it's an impossible task and I think it's a really stupid task to give anyway why specify that I'm sure we'll learn later but I still think that's very dumb just on a surface level that's like challenging me to take a poop without peeing like yeah it's super difficult I might be able to do it with enough focus and like creative strategizing but what do I get out of it? And what do you get out of it as the Sith Master? The poop still gets done with or without the pee, so who really cares, you know? Like, if the Jedi are dead, that you want dead, why does it matter how they were? I'm very curious to see why the fixation on not using a weapon is there. But anyway, eventually, she finds the Wookiee Jedi, Kalnaka. And <laughs> what, it, what ends up, the big reveal, he's already dead. He's been by a lightsaber. So we don't even get the easy slam dunk here of seeing a Wookiee Jedi do anything. He's just already dead. <laughs> what a fumble. That's the easiest dunk of all time. Like, you don't even have to try hard. Just have him do anything and people would clap for it. But they didn't. They actually just had him off screen and you see his corpse for two seconds. That's it. That's just a shockingly stupid decision. Unless they bring him back with some kind of force necromancy, I don't see him having an, a role in the in the show going, it's just, that was his role, to get hit with a lightsaber off screen and add to this mystery of who did it. Of which, I don't think there's a real mystery present because it seems super obvious that I'm praying they're not going to do it. But anyway, I didn't even get to the stupidest part. So May, the main villain of the series, who is two Jedi Masters right now, she had a great fight scene with the first Jedi Master in Episode 1 with the bar scene. It's a great fight, which is a really, like, narratively, it's a stupid fight. And how the Jedi Master at May's hand is pretty underwhelming. But the fight is very flashy. It's choreographed very well. As I have said since the last video I made, the action choreography in the show is pretty good. Like, I like the fights a lot. You know what Episode 4 has none of? Fights. You know what Episode, have, episode 4 has a lot of? Nothing. So they're not even utilizing the strongest part of the show. There's no fights here, which they could have easily had for the Wookiee Jedi. She also did another Jedi Master, albeit in a much less interesting way. Master Torbin, who was just this lobotomite that couldn't stop levitating. He literally just levitates for like 24 hours a day, I guess, and refuses to talk to anyone until May came through with a little vial of poison. And then he floats down and he says thanks and himself, basically. Well, not basically. He literally just drinks the poison and <laughs> that's it. So, like, we've had one good fight with the Jedi Master, and I really thought we'd have for the Wookiee Jedi, but nope. Subverted those expectations in the lamest way ever. But the stupidest part is, Mei has two Jedi Masters, and in the middle of the forest here with Kamir, she decides to, like, booby trap him. So she strings him up with, like, this trap where he's now, like, hanging upside down, and she says to him that now that she learned that her sister Osha is alive, She's going to turn herself into the Jedi. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. This comes out of nowhere, mind you. May has spent 16 years as a villain and been working with this Sith Lord for most of that time. And now all of a sudden, she learns Osha is alive, which I feel like she probably would have learned at some other point if she did any research at all and into, into any of the Jedis that she was hunting. She would have learned that Master Soul, which is one of the four Jedi she's tasked with, was the teacher to Osha. Like, that's 
publicly accessible knowledge in the in like the Jedi Order, I feel like May, given her endless resources, I suppose, with the Sith Lord, would have absolutely immediately spotted Osha was alive because she is the one of the registered Padwans to Master Soul, one of her targets. Like I feel like there's no way she didn't know that, but I'm reading way too deep into it. Like my thinking cap is on when it should be off. I'm watching a Star Show, I guess. I'm, I'm, go I'm going way too hard on it. But anyway, she learns Osha's alive and then decides her plan is to turn herself into the Jedi. And Kamir's like, well, that's stupid. You know they're going to, like, lock you up forever. And she's like, no, I know that they want to know about the Sith Lord, the, the Sith that's training her. I have information they're going to want, so they'll take it easy on me. You two Jedi Masters. Like, you can't just, like, that's not you can just wash your hands of and they're just going to, like, pat you on the back and be like, all right, hey, you gave us good info. It's okay, you these two Jedi Masters. All is forgiven. All's right in the world. Like, I don't know how you could be that dumb. Like, how can you be that stupid? There's no way. That is terrible, terrible writing. And it comes out of nowhere. It comes out of actually nowhere. Because keep in mind, May is the reason Osha and her were even separated in the first place and why she thought Osha was dead. Because when they were kids, in episode 3 of the flashback scene, May says to Osha's face that she is going to Osha. Because Osha wanted to leave and join the Jedi. So May sets the entire building ablaze and leads to the death of her entire family and everyone else there. That was May, the psychotic plan that she hatched as a child. And now all of a sudden she's like, oh, my sister's alive. This changes everything. I'm going to turn myself into the Jedi because my loyalty is to my sister. That's one of the lines she says verbatim. Her loyalty is to her sister. You tried to her. You literally not only tried to her, but you ended up having a hand at least in everyone else around there with that fire like what do you mean where is this coming from i i don't know if this is that's going to be explored deeper into the show or not or if i'm just supposed to accept that <laughs> that tonal shift in the character motivation but i don't even know how you can flesh that out like i don't know how you can make that make sense i i don't know you just pull it out of your... But anyway, the episode concludes with the Jedi, including Osha. I think it's six Jedi, uh, including Osha and Master Soul. They track Mei using this special gopher. It's like this weird little animal that they feed or have sniff a piece of the Wookiee Jedi Naka's clothing. So he takes like a huge huff of the fumes there. Uh, like he chloroforms himself with the Wookiee scent and then they start tracking Naka because they know that's where Mei's going. They eventually encounter... May, uh, she's inside the ship with Kalnaka's dead body, and while they're outside, the Sith Lord floats down, and the red lightsaber comes out. And then, uh, Osha is right in front of him, and he force pushes her away, and then all six Jedi charge at him. Awful battle plan. These are some of the most highly trained machines in the galaxy, and the best they could do is, like, basically sleepwalk at this Sith Lord that's now presented itself. Keep in mind, this is the first time they're seeing a Sith ever. Like, th they are thought to be extinct. This is a huge deal. And the best they do is, like, lightly jog at him with their lightsabers drawn, and he force pushes all of them away. Credits roll for episode four. Now, I did see a lot of hooting and hollering about how this breaks canon, because in The Phantom Menace, they were all shocked to learn that Sith were still around in any capacity. But since this was going on and there's clearly a Sith that they have now seen, they would have at least had that knowledge, you would think. But I don't, I'm not even here to really talk about it breaking Star Wars canon, because I'm here to just look at the show on its own, on its own two feet, not even thinking about how it ties into other Star property. I just wanted to watch this as its own show, as if nothing else in Star Wars existed, and it's still bad. Like, even if you go into this only caring about what you're seeing in Acolyte and not how it ties into other things, it's still just not good. It's just boring, and it is really poorly written, even in its own self-contained four episodes so far. It's also really weak visually. For a $100 million plus budget, this actually does feel like that would fit right at home on the CW station. Like, every time they show Coruscant, I want to cry. Like, it just looks terrible. It actually looks like a PlayStation 1 cutscene. And a lot of the visuals just look super cheaply made and haphazardly thrown together. And that is not the VFX team's fault. These VFX teams are getting used and abused. And they just have no time to actually finish their work anymore. And my heart breaks for them. It is so sad. 
how poorly treated the VFX artists are. So I don't blame them at all when a show comes out looking like this because I know this isn't their choice. They just didn't have time because of these strict deadlines that they get hammered with to actually fully flesh out the visuals. Now, there is I want to mention, I hinted at it a moment ago about very predictable, Kamir. I'm still not going to bother looking his name up because I just don't care enough about his name. Kamir being the sidekick of May, the one that made the poison for her. I am quite certain that he is the Sith Lord, the mysterious man in the motorcycle helmet with the red lightsaber. I think they are making it very obvious that he is a lot deeper than we're being led to believe he is. He's not just some goofball that May is traveling with who also happens to be indebted to this mysterious Sith Lord. I am pretty confident that they're going to have the big reveal that Kamir is the Sith Lord. Both he and May are on this planet and now the Wookiee Jedi is mysteriously slashed with a lightsaber and somehow the Sith Lord is also here. All while Kamir isn't present, he's supposedly still entangled in May's trap. It all just seems like it's going to be him that's the Sith Lord, which I think is the most predictable ever, and I'm fingers crossed they don't do that. I Like, that would be so if they actually did, because it's so obvious. That would be really... I mean, I guess that'd be fitting for the show, to be fair, but still. It, like, it would still feel so lame. I just wanted to put that out there. I think that's the direction they're going, but I'm hoping it's not. But yeah... I just watched episode 4 and I just had to talk about it a little bit more here. Now I'm committed to just finishing the show to see how it wraps up. Like, I'm, I'm really wondering where they're going to try and take this. Because right now it's just not good. Like, it's just, it's really not good at all. But at least the fighting is good when it's there. Episode 4 had none of that, unfortunately. But when there is fighting, I do like it. They've done, Whoever's working on their action, like the action department here, the choreographer, they are carrying... They're, they're putting some actual into it, and I appreciate it. Hopefully, the next episodes are only action, because that's the only thing this is getting right. Anyway, that's about it. See ya. Netflix released themselves this week with their anti-sharing stance, where they are going to be dropping the Iron Curtain on everyone that shares them, kicking off roughly 100 million users in order to force them to sign up in order to access Netflix. A very strict set of rules were revealed on their website where you would now have to always be logging in every 31 days from the primary household and anything else would be treated as treasonous and you'd be sent straight to jail in prison for life because you shared a Netflix. I'm exaggerating the terms a little bit, but that's basically them. In a Nobody liked it. This is one of those things where every single human being on the world, despite all of our differences, we can come together, you know, form a big circle around the bonfire that is the Netflix stock that would have went up in flames had they gone through with that idea. But it seems like they've backpedaled on it, and just like me when I'm wiping my ass and the toilet paper breaks and my fingers touch my- It was a big oops moment, they're claiming. They're saying that they never meant to publish those terms about the anti-sharing, that that system is not going live as of right now, and they've deleted it from their website, claiming it was all an error. I don't know if I believe them, but to me this feels like an example of one of the few times it actually works for a greater good, where a giant multi-billion dollar company just got bullied into getting rid of a completely dog proposal. But make no mistake, there has not been won. This victory was just a small battle. A simple because Netflix has made it very clear they are 100% cracking down on sharing, but I think with all of the pushback after this announcement came back, or came out, they're just going to go back to the drawing board on how to, like, lightly do it, a little less, like, cutthroat, because they everyone. Like, what they were proposing was brutal, with absolutely no wiggle room for anyone or anything. Now, I did go over all this on stream, but I'll briefly mention that they did say that this is currently in effect in some Latin American countries as, like, a test. So they're kind of, like, guinea-pigging other territories before bringing it to the States. And I guess this could potentially have been them, like, dipping their toes in the water, but it was a little too hot, so they pulled their toes out real quick, saying it was an error. But if you want my opinion, and by no means am I an expert, I'm just a local idiot guy, I think Netflix's primary concern would be making their catalog stronger. Because out of all the main players in the streaming space, aside from which is legitimately a joke of a service, they have the weakest catalog. Watching their originals is about as painful as watching your girlfriend cheat on you. Like, they just don't have anything that makes it worth it to sign up. Like, it's, it's enough to keep people that are currently signed up 
there and the people that are already sharing there because they already have it but it's just not good enough to bring in new like subscribers i don't think so when you kick off the 100 million people and you keep the catalog as winky dinky as it is they're not going to just turn around and sign up because there's nothing on there that they really want to watch or need to watch and again it's just going to incentivize piracy even if there is a couple that they want to watch from Netflix because they do have a couple good originals of course they're not all bad it's just the most majority of them I would say are pretty bad because Netflix has this big problem with just throwing money at everything for no reason it feels like like things that you've never even heard of and things that they don't even bother to promote themselves how many of you have heard of the show Bruce Brothers it's a Netflix original comedy show Matt calls it the worst show he's ever watched in his life I didn't even bother to watch it past the first 30 minutes. And yet that's a Netflix original they put a, put a lot of money behind. Like they just have so many of these things that not even they're promoting as their original catalog and they're putting tons of money into it. So they're losing a lot on that and it's not good enough to keep people wanting to subscribe to Netflix. So if you want those hundred million people to maybe consider subscribing, give them a better catalog and don't just like cold turkey cut them off. Like there's definitely better ways of handling it if that's the goal. But anyway, I'll go, I'll play some of the clips now where I go a bit deeper into the thing. Yeah, we can talk about Netflix. Uh, so it's only been 24 hours since the news broke that Netflix was going to be everyone off of shared accounts, sharing illegal, you're going to jail for life, and you're going right to hell. It's a sin that's unforgivable. You know, bah humbug, Christmas is ruined, don't care if your parents are divorced, you're not sharing accounts across households. It's always going to have to be... One primary location, walking every 31 days to refresh it, and we're going to let you from our bosom and get seven days of travel. But then you'll have to come back and refresh that at the main household. So that news broke. Obviously, everyone's upset. Terrible decision. That is, according to their estimation, 100 million people share. So that's 100 million people that they just kicked off. I don't know how in their Silicon Valley rotted minds, they thought that that would somehow lead to like an uptick in subscribers. It won't, at least not, not anything meaningful, I don't think. But anyway, everyone's on it, everyone's throwing tomatoes saying, boo, boo, bad, boo, Netflix, boo, not good, yucky, stinky, you guys, you guys, you guys stink. And then today, according to a couple sources, they backpedaled on all of it, saying that it was posted in error. Now, I can't find any official statement from them outside of, like, these sources that just say they told their publication that it was an error. So I don't even know if it's 100% true or not that they're trying to backpedal on it. But if that is, that's a pretty pathetic way of doing it. That's, like, actually a child. Like, when a kid sends a text message to their crush, like, Hey, I like you, and they don't respond in 15... And then they're like, oh, haha, whoa, this is something that was my friend that sent that. That wasn't me, that was an accident. Like, that is 100% like the Netflix play here. Oh, whoa, this is weird. We didn't mean any of this. How did that even get out there? Oh, no, that's just an accident. Obviously, they they made a very strong statement last year about shutting down uh, the sharing. So they are going to do it, but I guess the pushback on this one was too big, so they're calling it a mistake now. So I don't know. I'm a little confused like on the particulars here. On what exactly they're trying to do. They saw everyone canceling and panicked. So their stock did drop, but not that much since this isn't fully in effect yet. So they did have a bit of a... Why didn't their stock just come up? Oh, then news. So they did have a bit of a stock drop. About 1%. Not anything huge. For a brief time yesterday, a Help Center article containing information that is only applicable to Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru went live in other countries, the spokesperson said, adding, we have since updated it. So that was their excuse for all of it. So I think that they're rolling out in several Latin American countries to test it before being worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're just at this point where they think people need Netflix. But that's just not the reality of the situation. There's so many other streaming services, and even if they just want your originals, they'll just pirate it. If they can't share the account, it becomes far more convenient for a lot of people to just start pirating. Everyone knows how to torrent. 
I don't know why they're pretending that they don't know about that. This is just going to be to reinvigorate the Pirate Bay at that point. If it works, other streaming services will do it. Yeah, I mean, I guess if this does turn out well for them, we'd see this extended across the other ones. I just watched the new Netflix Resident show. Don't cry for me. I did this to myself. I knew what I was getting into. I made the decision to watch this show even knowing it would probably... And it did. After the an insulting tragedy that was the live-action Netflix Cowboy Bebop show, I didn't think it would be possible for them to make the same mistake. But they did. Again. With Resident... It's wild to me how little they learned from Cowboy Bebop. It's like the company is run by people without a brain. It's just an algorithm that's malfunctioning right now. So they're just taking random properties and adapting them into bad shows. Why do they keep doing this? Isn't the world full of enough pain already? Why add more to it with these miserable video game adaptations? First the Halo show, now Resident. Is nothing sacred anymore? What's next? Are they gonna target Doom? They're gonna release a new Doom Netflix show that's all about a high school quarterback who's a little arrogant and then gets his comeuppance when a gamer nerd steals his girlfriend? Like, I don't understand. Why adapt a video game if it's not gonna have anything in common with it? Of course, the obvious, most commonly accepted answer is marketing because these properties come with a built-in. But that's completely useless when that built-in drops the show after a single episode when it's become clear that there is nothing in common with that show and the franchise that they like. I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but I'm starting to believe that there's nefarious afoot here. Some kind of puppet master pulling the strings, and he is addicted to eating glue, snorting auto paint, and huffing air dusters. Because they have it in their head that it's a good idea to take beloved properties and adapt them into generic schlock that is unrecognizable from the property they're supposed to be adapting. It is a formula that has proven nothing but failure so far, and yet for some reason they still seem keen on doing it. We just saw it with Halo, and now we're seeing it with Resident And the Resident Netflix show is basically like if the Halo show did a fusion dance with the Dragon Ball Evolution movie. It's just a disaster. It has nothing in common with the video games it's supposed to be adapting, except for sprinkling a few easter eggs throughout the show. That's about it. It doesn't really have any semblance of like actual connection to it doesn't even feel like it was loosely inspired by the video games feels like what they did is read a wikipedia entry on each game and then just grabbed a few sentences from each one and then put them throughout the episodes occasionally as just a little easter egg for members to find and maybe point and be like i, I recognize that but otherwise there's just nothing in common with this show and resident Evil aside from a few borrowed names let me go ahead and show you a scene that's been floating around Twitter and then explain to you the context of it because it's even stupider when I tell you why this scene is happening. This is a spoiler. This is the end of the show and it's supposed to be like a big reveal kind of situation like <gasps> shock as you're covering your mouth, recoiling in your chair and throwing popcorn bowl over your shoulder because it's just so shocking. What? The song Don't Start Now by Dua Lipa starts playing here but I can't let that audio ride or else I'll get DMCA'd. So just sing that song in your head. That's the soundtrack to this little dance number here. And it really, it goes on for a little while. You get like a little Broadway play performance out of it. And uh, you know, what's not to like, right? Now this scene's obviously pretty silly. And the video games are no stranger to campiness and some fun wacky moments. But this show doesn't really have that vibe. They play it pretty serious for the majority of it, aside from like some rogue jokes that don't really work. Which if you've been on Twitter for the last day or so, I'm sure you've seen the clips floating around because people are just slamming and jamming on it. One of the jokes is about Zootopia porn, and then another one is about torrenting anime. The jokes don't really land, but I'm not here to nitpick the comedic moments. What I'm saying is... The comedic moments aren't, like, a focal point of the show. It doesn't really try and capture the campiness. So when it comes out of nowhere with this really goofy dance scene, it's just kind of jarring. Now let me explain why this scene is happening, because maybe the context makes this taste better. Well, you see, Evelyn is being controlled by an iPad. Well, not like a, not like a sentient iPad or anything like that. It's not some rogue AI that came to life Skynet-style and, and took over. 
it is a person who is using an iPad to control Evelyn, which is why she's doing this dance recital thing. Though to be honest with how the writing was, I wouldn't put it past them for season two to just make some kind of unhinged sci-fi plot line about AI taking over to annihilate humans. The humans are the real virus, or like that. But yeah, Evelyn's not a robot or anything, it's just they were able to inject her with enough and control her brain through the iPad. Pretty, pretty cool, I guess. I want to make it clear, I actually don't think the Resident show is like the worst show ever made or anything. It's just a very generic show that borrows from a great franchise. It's pretty shameless. They should have just any other name on this and it would have been received much better. They should have just called it like Zombies, Playtime is Over, or Apocalypse, Lunch Break. Just anything that isn't Resident adjacent because this really has nothing to do with the Resident franchise aside from borrowing a couple character names and references. Netflix stock is down 70% this year, and I think if they announce season 2 of Resident, it'll drop another 30%, baby. They can do it. I think it's just right around the corner. They're just one more bad video game adaptation away from just a complete and utter collapse, it feels. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but it's just so insulting that this continues to happen. There is no reason to take a video game, make a show out of it, without having anything in common with the video game. What is the point? You don't get new viewers because the show isn't good enough to stand on its own two legs, and you don't get the video game viewers that like the property because the show has nothing to do with the game they like. So who's winning here? All the sides are losing. There's no purpose to making a show like Resident here when it has nothing to do with the games. It's like games taught us the only winning move is not to play. Stop making these video game adaptations. If you're not going to hire a team that's at least played the games and wants to do with it, like a faithful adaptation, then just don't do it. That's the only way these things work. I don't think there's anything wrong with making your own universe or your, sorry your own show based on a video game universe in fact i prefer it i don't want a live action one-to-one -one remake of resident i would prefer if they tell their own story but set in the universe properly where the characters that are in resident are faithfully adapted into the show and in the show they can do whatever they want to further the plot but the characters just need to at least have similar personality and motivation to the what they did in the game there's no reason to just completely drastically change and rewrite characters from the game to your show. That immediately disconnects it from the video game that you're adapting. There's just no reason to do that. Halo, for example, did that with Master Chief. Master Chief never even shows his face in the games, whereas in Episode 1, he immediately takes his helmet off and he keeps it off for the show, basically. And he also has his butt cheeks out more times than pretty much any other character in any show this year. There's so much cheek in Halo which is never present in the games. It's a completely different thing, and there's no reason for that. And as you can probably imagine, Halo didn't do that well. People dropped it after one or two episodes, and it just wasn't a good show in general. It's just, if you're going to adapt a video game, why not make it faithful to the video game? That, that'd be the point. There's no reason to take the name of Resident and make that has nothing to do with it. Nobody wins in that situation. Netflix up, and I'm sure they will continue to up because for some reason, this very basic understanding of how things work isn't registering with a lot of these Hollywood producers that are making shows based on games. It is just, there's gone wrong here. They somehow didn't learn that lesson with Dragon Ball Evolution, or the last Airbender movie, or the Hitman movie, or the Creed movie, or all of the Resident movies. Somehow, they still saw all the failure in the Resident live action franchise and then still made another failure with the show just to add more dog onto that pile. It just, it makes no sense to me. Netflix needs to stop with this and not just Netflix, but in general, all these streaming platforms have got to stop trying to make a video game adaptation by people that don't know the property and don't want to know the property. Again, the Halo team was proud that they didn't play any of the Halo games. They outright said in their interviews, we didn't touch the games and we didn't talk about the games. And look what happened. Disaster. I imagine the same thing happened with the Resident Evil show here. If I had to wager a guess, they have had a very rudimentary understanding of the games. But yeah, anyway, just wanted to rant about this a bit since I watched the Resident Evil show. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So yeah. Today the world gets a little bit brighter because the idol is finally over 
And boy howdy, I tell you, the season finale is special. An unbelievable disaster. This series is only five episodes long, but it delivers cringe that will last a lifetime. Five episodes, and it feels like you get about as much story as reading five seconds of a Tumblr erotic fanfic. There is nothing of substance here, no message to be delivered, and the final episode is downright insulting. I think this season is up there with Game of Thrones Season 8 in terms of how much of a catastrophe it is. The final episode here is an actual speedrun to just end the show as quickly as possible, because I guess the director, Sam Levinson, had already busted his nut and was just kind of done with the property. I'll dive into the meatballs of this spaghetti in just a moment with the finale here, but I just want to say, I am convinced now that my theory is correct. I believed that this show only existed because Sam Levinson is a degenerate who made this show for his own pleasure, and the finale kind of confirms my hypothesis. The finale basically just ends abruptly, without bothering to finish any plot lines or have a sensical conclusion whatsoever. Again, I, I'll get into it in a moment, but I honestly can't think of any other reason for this show's existence other than Sam Levinson having to play the skin flute too. Like, there is nothing of value here, and legitimately everything in this show is... There is not a single scene that goes by where Lily Rose Depp's character, Jocelyn, doesn't have her titties out. Even as simple as going to the store looking for clothes has her with her cheeks clapping in the wind and nipple boobies just flopping around and then eventually getting raw dogged in the dressing room moaning for the entire store to hear. There is not a moment that goes by in this show that isn't just softcore pornography. It's, it's baffling. It doesn't have a message. And it's not just Jocelyn, but she's the main character and Sam uses her like just a portal to the honkers dimension. Even though she is actually an interesting character that could have had a really interesting story told about her, instead Sam just decided to focus on making the show just a countdown till her melons pop out. That's it. It is very much a show that seems to be only about this and nothing else. And also making the weekend a clown. I have a conspiracy theory that I think Sam Levinson secretly hates The Weeknd and convinced him to take this role just so people would make fun of him for it. So they wrote the goofiest, most over-the-top character ever, and Sam convinced The Weeknd that it was a good idea. Because I, I don't understand how he even signed up for this role. It is genuinely... The Idol is one of those rare where it doesn't have a single fan. Pretty much everything ever will at least have a couple of people pumping their fists defending it from people that didn't like it, but not The Idol. The only group of people I've seen defending The Idol are actual porn-addicted coomers and not much else. And them ejaculating over the show, I wouldn't exactly call a great defense for the show being good. And, and that's really it. And I understand why, like, that's the only people stepping to go to bat for the show, because that's really all the show is. It, it really does kind of boil down to, well, looked like it was just softcore pornography after all, and there was no real story here. This is one of just the very exceptionally rare where pretty much everyone comes together to dislike the same thing equally. So I guess the idol works in that regard. It's like a unifying moment for everyone on the planet to laugh at this abomination. But now let's get into the finale. So I've made a video going over pretty much everything up till this point. So I'm not just going to recap everything, but let's just look at the finale and all of the sins that it commits. It pretty much just changes everything and abandons every plot point that it's built up over the season. Not that there's very many of those to begin with. But they do like a six weeks into the future thing, and every single character is completely different now. Everything has changed, and they just kind of fill you in a little bit on what's happened, which I think is always such a lazy cop-out, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Between episodes four and five, we saw that Jocelyn, her ex, to get back at Tedros for manipulating her. That was her ultimate revenge. And Tedros was outside of her room drinking and crying, listening to her cheeks get clapped. So that's kind of where episode four wrapped up. And episode five picks up with him in like a coke-induced trance. He's basically just a lobotomite wandering around, like short-circuiting because he's on so much coke and so goddamn loaded. But uh, eventually he hatched the plan where Xander took a picture of Rob with one of Tedros's. Uh, girls in the cult and then posted a story that Rob had her. So episode five starts off with 
Jocelyn's best friend learning that Rob is being accused of because Xander framed Rob for Tedros. And Jocelyn figures this out and tries kicking Tedros out of the house. She's very mad. She, she keeps trying to get him out of the house because she's been manipulated and she's had a complete 180 on everything here. She's finally seeing the truth. So she wants him out. But she doesn't get mad at Xander, who legitimately did this. Like, he... While he was just a marionette on the strings for the puppet master Tedros to control, Xander still knew full well what the plan was. To get Rob, you know, out of the picture here for Tedros, and accused him of which cost him his entire career. And for some reason, Jocelyn doesn't care about Xander doing that. In fact, Jocelyn still makes Xander one of the headline opening acts for her. Which is an interesting play from the chess master Jocelyn here, but episode 5 basically is a completely different person than the entire series has ever shown us and it happens like that like all of a sudden they just wrote a totally different character and just put jocelyn's name on it because now she, all of a sudden she's taking control and she's kicking tedros out which is good like you know it's about time she's she's opened up to the scam and hates tedros getting tedros out of there but she's taking all of tedros's extremely talented um singers and putting them in her show but then there's like this half the episode is spent with all of those singers performing and it goes on for way too long they're performing in front of all the music video or music industry executives and they're like oh this is mind-blowing i've never heard someone sing notes like that oh my god this is the lord has come down and blessed us for this performance you're all hired we're we're doing it big baby and that's like half the episode so it drags on for so 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 long but during these performances there's a scene where the older lady is talking to Tedros and she's like, I know Jocelyn didn't do this. This is you, Tedros, didn't you? And she's like, I'm awake because he's fading into the shadow realm from being so high. And he's like, yeah, no, this was me. And she's like, okay, well, you and I need to work together because this is this is real talent. You found them. And then actually three weeks later, she just hates Tedros. She's like, yeah, he's such a weird loser, Tedros. And then helps to ruin his entire life because he is a bad guy. Uh, eventually... Uh, once Jocelyn gives them the okay, they run a big piece exposing Tedros as like a former pimp who went to jail for a lot of heinous. And that lady who actually three years ago wanted to help Tedros and work with Tedros and not Jocelyn, apparently was integral to helping that come to play. Why and how? Th this is what I'm saying. They set up these things in the, in the episode too, and then just forget that it ever happened and pretend that it never did. Like it doesn't follow any plot lines to its conclusion it just leaves them and forgets another one jocelyn's best friend has been hyping up or has been hyped up across the entire series as the only person seeing through tedros's scam seeing him for the person that he is and in this episode she she's happy to see jocelyn finally learning that too but she still kind of gets left in the left in the dust by jocelyn who doesn't really like communicate super well with her and she just leaves and she's never heard from again like they don't even like address what happens she just vanishes <laughs> like out of nowhere she leaves a note on jocelyn's bed and unless i've been like neuralized by the men in black they never even show what the note was or even hint at what it could be she just is gone like actually just left this corporeal dimension out of nowhere without doing anything so her entire existence in the show was meaningless she did nothing by the end nothing that she did contributed to anything it's, it's actually just shocking. Like, me explaining this episode sounds like the ravings of a mad lunatic. But this is actually how the episode plays out. It is nonsensical, convoluted, messy, stinky, repulsive. Like, it's awful. Everything that could go wrong with a single finale went wrong with this one. It's an absolute disaster by all definitions it just really feels like sam ha was in his refractory period post nut clarity he's like damn i really didn't make a good show here let's just end it because originally this show was pitched as six episodes but then they like cut it down to five i guess and then are trying to pretend like no that never happened that's the mandela effect it, it's always been five episodes and it's like no i just watched the finale and there's no way you meant for it to be five episodes because it feels like an entire episode is missing there is so much development that must have happened off screen in between these like fever dream cuts of an episode like they, there had to be that explained it and that developed the characters there at some point and it's not here so they like loosely cut together that resembled a plot but not really it's terrible you remember how i mentioned in like episode two or like where the backup dancer for jocelyn was stabbing her in the back the music industry executives are like 
Jocelyn's backup dancer can sing and dance really well. Let's give her Jocelyn songs since Jocelyn's going through such a weird period in her life. And they were hyping that up like it was going to be the biggest plot point. Like, oh my god, she's now getting betrayed by people that she thought she could trust. And it turns out that that lady's working with Tedros. What's going to come from this? Spoiler alert, nothing. In this finale, they sit that girl down again and they say, Hey, we changed our mind. You can't have Jocelyn's song anymore. And then they send her on her way. They just say, Scram, get out of here. It's, it's like actually a one scene, maybe five sentences, and that's it. They just wrote that entire thing out, and you never see that character again for the rest of the episode. It even had the gall to try and be deep for a moment, where Tedros gets pulled aside by Jocelyn's manager, and he's telling the story of Little Red Riding Hood, and they're doing like cuts to Jocelyn like, she's Little Red Riding Hood. And he's like, do you know what happened to the big bad wolf? He got gutted by the hunter, and I'm the hunter. And then, <laughs> then he, like, tries to pay him off to get out of Jocelyn's life, which Tedros doesn't accept. So then they print the piece about how he's a pimp and a horrible person, which ruins his entire life, basically. And then Jocelyn goes to her tour six weeks later, because they do a time jump, and she's wearing a red hood. Thus, going with the Little Red Riding Hood story that her manager told earlier. But it's so goofy and pretentious, because that story had no bearing on anything, like it didn't actually make any sense in the context of the show. It tried so hard to be deep, and I can already just picture the the think tank at the Idol HQ, the writing room, filled with cigars in soiled trousers from constantly ejaculating about the amount of that they're writing in the show. And they're like, we need real profound, real deep. They hit another line. What about Little Red Riding Hood? Genius! Oh my god, Sam, genius! Print it, write it down, quick, quick! But it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense in the show at all. It's, it falls so flat. It's like they really thought that this would be like a statement piece, like the idol would be remembered for this Little Red Riding Hood moment. But all it was was so laughably pathetic. So pathetic. But by far the biggest in the finale commits is its last 10. The last 10 have to be some of the worst in all of televised history. So basically, Tedros's career gets ruined, right? So everything gets shut down, they, they expose him for being a pimp and holding a woman hostage, going to prison for six years for awful... And then Jocelyn's on tour, she's about to perform, and Tedro shows up at the ticket booth asking if he has any tickets, not really expecting much because Jocelyn, you know, said, you get out of my life, I hate you, we're done, but he still decided just to try. And it turns out Jocelyn did leave him tickets. So Tedros takes the tickets, goes to see Jocelyn in the dressing room, and then uh, she's, you know, taken back control. Now she's the authority figure. And this is supposed to show the development how she's no longer like, you know, a puppet or putty in the hands of Tedros. But it actually still feels like that's the same thing because she can't live without him, which she makes pretty clear. He is the love of her life. And she makes that very clear to him. So it seems like the power was still on Tedros' side. So they didn't even tell the story of Jocelyn getting out from a manipulative, abusive situation and getting out of a cult. It had her going right back in the very end. And it even had an, a deplorable scene where Tedros picks up the hairbrush that Jocelyn talked about her mom abusing her with. There was a very, you know, uncomfortable scene from like episode three where she opens up about how her mom used to abuse her in, you know, in order to push her to make the best possible music. And Tedros is like, give me that hairbrush. And then he starts beating the shit out of her with the hairbrush to try and help her realize her potential. So Tedros is in the dressing room here in the finale. He sees that brush and he's like, this is the hairbrush your mom abused you with, right? And she says, yeah. And then he turns it over and he's like, but it's new. And then she just looks at him back in the mirror. I'm not even making that up. That's a real scene here. And then she goes on stage and all of the music execs are celebrating like Tedros is finally out of the picture this awful person is finally gone. And Jocelyn goes on stage and says, Tedros, come out here. And then she just makes out with him in front of the entire stadium, who now knows that this guy is a pimp, uh, like all kinds of horrible things about him, and calls him the love of her life and that he's hers forever. And then instructs him just to go watch backstage. I couldn't have envisioned a worse ending for this show. I, I, I mean that. It, it accomplishes nothing. It doesn't deliver any message at all. And in fact, 
the only semblance of a message that it does deliver is a very disgusting one. Jocelyn never breaks free from the mind control spell of Tedros. She is still under the, under the complete control of the shaman here, where she can't live without him. And he is still legitimately a horrible person who, from the very beginning, was manipulating her. And she still invites him openly back into her life to share the spotlight with her. It's just baffling. If they wanted to write it where it's like a complete flip, where Jocelyn's the one in control now, then they really missed the mark. Like, dreadfully. She did have a moment where, like, she is the authority figure and kicks Tedros out, but then they don't commit to it and just bring Tedros back. <laughs> like, and he hasn't changed. There is no development for Tedros. From the very beginning, he hasn't been changed at all as a character. It's, it's so weird. And I haven't even covered all of it. This is probably only half of, like, the plot points that don't make any sense or the plot lines that they just forgot about or abandoned. It's just truly awful. The Idol is, without a doubt, one of the worst shows they've ever really made. And, and, and I know that's like a big claim to make, but I'm talking on a big budget scale. Of course, there's like, you know, really low budget that just gets, you know, vomited out on like a direct-to-DVD, you know, season or on some TV channel like CW pumps out awful seasons of all the time. But as far as big budget and like big name shows go, I think this is the worst. Five episodes of nothing worthwhile at all. Nothing even remotely coming close to even resembling a value. It's horrible. Uh, the only that could ever really appreciate it is just people that are there to watch porn, basically. That's it. That's, that's the show. It's so bad. But yeah, I mean, I, I finished it. The season's over, which is nice. Now, now we don't have any more of The Idol, which is a good thing. I, I don't think they're getting a season two. That's for damn sure. But yeah, anyway, just wanted to kind of just, you know, for, for my for my own sanity, just rant and vent about what I just watched here. That's really about it. See ya. I know what you're thinking. Charles, have you been drinking? Yes. Very astute observation. We did a BAC Olympics for the other channel today. Don't want to spoil anything, but I performed very well. Uh, besides the point, I may have been drinking, but no amount of alcohol would be enough to make me enjoy the finale of The Acolyte. Now, I've made two videos on The Acolyte. I've been very open and honest. I haven't really liked a lot of the star content that's come out over the last like decade and some change. Save for a couple of exceptions like Andor or the first two seasons of Mandalorian or very hot take, even the solo standalone movie. But aside from that, I just haven't found myself enjoying much of it. And The Acolyte I started just because of how much it was on by the majority of people. And I just can't resist horrible media. I'm drawn to awful media like a coke addict to baking soda. So I indulged in this property to see if it really is as bad as everyone was saying. And while not good, I didn't think it was the worst thing Star Wars has ever made. Once again, that achievement, I still believe, belongs to Book of Boba Fett. But now after finishing The Acolyte, I can say for certain, it still belongs to Book of Boba Fett. The Acolyte isn't good. But there are some things about it that I did like. And by some things, I mean really kind of just one thing. The action. I know there's a lot of people out there saying there's nothing good about the Acolyte at all, but I think that's just being exaggeratory for the sake of it. The action is probably the best since the prequels. Like, the lightsaber fights I actually found to be pretty hype. Now, of course, there's some goofiness to it, and yeah, you can kind of nitpick them, but they are flashy, they are fun, and I did enjoy pretty much every action sequence. Aside from that, though, there's not a lot else to like about it. Narratively, I think it's kind of a mess, and... There's going to be spoilers here. There's no way for me to talk about this show without getting into spoilers. I think the most egregious egregious example, excuse me, I'm starting to fumble some words around, but, you know, I'm taking the field sobriety test here with the, the Acolyte trivia breakdown. I think the most egregious example of lazy writing is in episode 7. So episode 7 is this big revelation for the sins of the past with the Jedi being bad and in the wrong with Osha and May and the cult of witches. So... I don't even hate the Jedi bad thing that a lot of people are really starting to spit about. 
that doesn't bother me. I'm fine with that. As long as you build it up properly and you make it make sense. Here, it doesn't. So, when the big revelation comes and they catch you with the back door reach around, like, here's the huge twist. It's very silly. So, it turns out that Torben, the guy who was floating for like 16 years, literally in suspended animation, basically just snoozing, acting like Zenyatta, and then May shows up and he decides to kill himself, drinking poison and thanking her for it. His was wanting to leave the planet the witches were on early. So, the Jedi were stationed on Brindock looking at uh, Virgins, and they ended up accidentally stumbling upon the witches. Sol saw the twins, and that led them to the witches. And Torben was crying about wanting to go home early. Wah, wah, wah. Give me some French cries. We've been here too long. I want to go home. So what ends up happening is Torben, in his haste to leave, decides to storm the witches' place to try and speed things along. Sol follows, and then it's an absolute disaster. Uh, Osha, as you all know from the previous episodes, wanted to go with the Jedi, May did not. There was this big back and forth conundrum with the witches where their mother, who was like the head of the coven, was going to let Osha go with the Jedi. She's like, you know what? She, th These are very important girls to the coven, and if Osha wants to be a Jedi, who are we to stop her? So she was already uh, on board, like, this is what Osha wants, this is what Osha's gonna do. So, Sol and Torben getting there early definitely throws a wrench in everything, but what ends up happening is it starts to get poopy. You have the big uh, disagreement between May and Osha, where Osha has a wild overreaction and decides to just set everything on fire, watch it all burn. And then, uh, Sol and Torben are with the witches, tensions are very high, and then it reaches a boiling point where the mother, in a panic, decides to turn into a demon in front of Sol. Without telling Sol that Osha decided to go with the Jedi, and Sol is there, you know, kind of talking about it, without informing him that that was the decision Osha made that they were going to abide by, she gets some news and turns into a monster. So she starts, like, evaporating into this, like, dark cloud, like, the, like this dark energy, and Sol stabs her, which her. And then as she's dying, she says, we were going to let Osha go with you, she chose the Jedi, and then collapses and... And that is the major shame of the Jedi in response to her getting by soul. The rest of the witches, I guess all of the witches, then decide to mind Jack Kalnaka, the Wookiee Jedi. And then, you know, they fight Kalnaka and it ends with him being overpowered. And then all of a sudden, when clearing Naka's mind, it's all of the witches who like force hacked into his brain. So they were doing like some kind of trance in order to take control of them. And when that was severed, when that connection was severed, all of them, like all of them, apparently, it took like the entire coven to do that one stunt, that one little trick. So when that was broken, it all of them, and that kind of finishes that off, and then of course the fire. I shouldn't really need to explain why this is super stupid, but I'm going to anyway. Why would the mother not start the conversation with like, hey, you know, we've got, we've got our, you know, disagreements, we don't see eye to eye, but Osha did choose you, and we're going to let her do that. Why would she instead jump scare everyone by turning into a monster in front of them without explaining anything? Like, Soul's not even in the wrong for reacting the way he did. Like, that, that could be perceived as a huge threat to, like, everyone, like, maybe even the twins, like, oh, maybe the mom's gonna kill the twins because we're here and, you know, Osha might want to go with us. Like, she didn't convey any useful information. She instead just transforms into a cloud of... Like, all she had to do was just communicate, and this thing could have been avoided. It also could have been avoided if Torben wasn't in some kind of speed run to get off the planet. I think that's super silly. So there were two very easy ways this could have been avoided if the characters were just thinking rationally. And that's, like, my big complaint about the series. The only reason things happen is because other characters were doing stupid So it feels really unfulfilling. Like, I don't even mind some of the story beats. Like I said, the Jedi bad thing, I don't mind. I think that can work really well. And it's not like that's never been done before in Star Wars. They made that really clear in Star Wars that the Jedi became complacent, you know? Like, a lot of the things that go wrong go tits up is because the Jedi are just kind of lazy. Like, that's not new. But the way that they get to that in this series is just not very good. 
And the finale does nothing to really solve that problem. I don't hate the finale. I think it's a fun final fight between Soul and the Stranger. I actually do like the Stranger, but I think he is also a pretty silly character. There's not a lot that was explored about him, but I like the Cortosis helmet. I think that's cool. The short short circuiting lightsabers by headbutting them and like him dual wielding like the tiny saber and the big saber. It's flashy and it's fun. But if you really start to think about what the character has said, he's a goddamn goofball. Like, his motivation is, I want to do what I want to do. What is he, six years old? Like, what, he wants to play in a sandbox room without mom and dad coming out there telling him he's got to go to bed and brush his teeth? Like, what? Like, what? Who cares? That's stupid. That's a really dumb motivation. His thing is, you know, the Jedi kind of betrayed him. They don't really explain exactly how. I'm sure that'll be in the future if they do a season two or God forbid. But the only real information we know about him is his primary motive here is, A... I got, and now I want to be, and I don't want anyone to have any complaints about it. So he wants to, you know, be free to be himself and use his power how he sees fit. And he really wants to train somebody. This guy loves being a teacher. And he's not the only one. Soul was obsessed with training the twins. Like, he really wanted Osha to be his padawan. So much so that he ended up in leading to the, of an entire coven of witches. I think it's a little over the top how obsessed Sol was with being, like, the master to these potential Padwans. So much so that he would be willing to do horrible. And this leads to, like, the cover-up thing where after the events of this, they buried all of it so that way it wouldn't surface. But you didn't really need to. So, like, a, a thing that comes in the finale here is about... Like, Sol thought he was in the right for what he did, and Osha pushes, pushes back saying, well, if you thought you were in the right, why didn't you tell the Jedi? I mean, that's a slam dunk right there. That's checkmate. She got you with the scholar's mate. That's a great point. If you thought you were in the right, why even cover it up? And you covered up significantly more than what was necessary. If a big reveal is that Osha and May aren't twins, they're the same person, but ultimately that doesn't really matter because they are still two different characters in the show. Like, they're fundamentally still just twins. But regardless... They are the same person made from the power from the virgins on the planet. Why wouldn't they just share that information with the Jedi? That wouldn't really implicate them in any, like, bigs that happened on the planet. And also, a big thing is that Sol didn't reveal a lot because he needed May to be alive in order to convince the Jedi. Why? You could still have that work with just Osha. You don't need both of them, unless I missed a crucial component there. That just seems like actual mumbo-jumbo. Like, why do you need both of them in order to convince them that this is real? Like, you, you, you have Osha, who is the product of the Virgins. Do you need May too? Like, you could have still... Like, I don't know. It just was really dumb, and it felt like they kind of backed themselves into a corner on trying to explain why it needed to be covered up to the level that it was. And I don't think they explained it super well, because ultimately, it didn't need to reach that level. Again, I don't understand why he couldn't just share that information about the virgins creating life here with Osha and not May. Really, a lot of everything that goes wrong in this show can be easily explained by the characters just didn't want to talk to each other. Like, it really seems like the characters have a huge apprehension with communication. Like, they just do not share information that would be extremely helpful for some reason. And another really convenient thing that they bring out for the finale is a mind eraser. Literally a Men in Black Neuralizer. So, the stranger has the ability to just wipe someone's mind. Which is an incredibly convenient ability. And then, of course... <laughs> of course, it then goes in to try and explain how all of this never really reached the point that it should where people were that the Sith are back... And I really think the way that it gets to that is dumb too. But man, that mind wash, like the uh, the scrubbing of memories, was such an... I think that that has been like established in Star Wars lore at some point. Like I definitely think I've read that. I haven't seen it, but I definitely think I've read it. But the way they bring it out here, I just think is so stupid. And of course, it's not Star Wars without your favorite cameos blasting onto the screen to get people hype and just... You know, going ballistic seeing them, so the back of Yoda's head's there. A split second of Plagueis is there. But it just, it doesn't do anything to make it better. 
It's just there to remind people of cool that Star used to have. It's just so disappointing because I'm not even touching on like how it ties into established Star lore. To me, that's not the most important thing. For me, it's about can this show stand on its own two legs without Star in it. Like if this had no tie to Star, would this be a good show on its own? And for me, the answer is no. I just really don't think it knew how to actually get to the things that it wanted to. So, Osha turns to the dark side. She bleeds her lightsaber in the finale and then she runs away happily ever after with the stranger. And it doesn't work. Like, at no point do they really build Osha into that decision. It just kind of happens, like, super suddenly. One second, she's like, Jedi. You know, Jedi, 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 may you really up and you're feeling bad for what you've done. And then she gets fed some new information about, like, what Sol did and instantly turns to the dark side without anything really building to that. Like, yes, that's super alarming information, but it's not like May's innocent either. May is also very much responsible for a lot of what happened with the, their mother and the entire coven. So, like, I feel like that decision to immediately turn to the dark side happens so quickly and she immediately becomes extremely powerful force choking in soul almost effortlessly like everything just kind of happens right when it needs to immediately without any proper build up to it so it just feels like whiplash seeing a character change so quickly so overall i just didn't think this show was very good I still maintain that it's not the worst Star show like a lot of people are saying it is. I still comfortably think that title belongs to the Book of Boba Fett. I think it hangs on to that prestige. But this one is definitely not good. It's another bad Disney Star product, unfortunately. But I said I would finish it, and I finished it. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. Uh, if I was to put it on the moist meter, I'd give it like a 35% maybe-ish. Somewhere in that general ballpark. I'm not really sure. But anyway, that's really about it. See ya.